life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of a lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the lamb. Would you do service? if you'd like to find some words that will help you to focus on the definition of what we're singing.
Let's take our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to be reading the entire chapter, or at least the first 21 verses of it. Ephesians chapter 3, I would invite you in honor of God's word, to, if you are able, to please stand with me as I read this text, and then we will consider this text in our message this morning. Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you again for the opportunity to review your word and pray that your Holy Spirit will minister to our hearts that which we need for our own encouragement and growth in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. By way of introduction, I want to share with you some statements that I found online that I thought were rather disturbing, to say the least, but they are statements that pertain to the, social, the, the world scene that is going on even now as we speak between Russia and Ukraine. These statements I gleaned from the various sources that are all available on the internet. And it doesn't really matter whether they're true or not, although I don't have any reason to doubt them. But what they imply as I read them will definitely give you a sense of where we're going this morning. Ukraine conscripts. Refusing to shoot and abandoning battlefield as Russia advances. Now, I can't even read that statement without 
and something of my own nationality standing up within me and saying, how can you do this? Some new Ukrainian conscripts are refusing to shoot at the enemy and are struggling with basic combat actions. It has been reported. Associated Press quoted commanders and soldiers from Ukraine's military who said conscripts had abandoned the battlefield. A battalion commander in Ukraine's 47th Brigade said, Some people don't want to shoot. They see the enemy in the firing position in trenches, but don't open fire. That is why our men are dying. When they don't use the weapon, they are ineffective. Another soldier added, The main problem is the survival instinct of newcomers before people could stand until the last moment to hold the position. Now even when there is light shelling of firing positions, they are retreating. Let me take a moment to recover my own emotions from hearing such statements. But these are statements that have highlighted to me a certain problem that every, every society has and every good endeavor that is to go forward faces discouragement. There is discouragement, there may be fears as well, there may be reasons behind what is going on, but in the, final, in the bottom line analysis, the forces on the battlefield are getting discouraged. I wonder if we don't face some discouragements of our own, perhaps within our own personal lives. Maybe things aren't going the way we might have wished or hoped that God would have led us. Perhaps within our family relationships, or perhaps even within our church family. We can look around and see, and as we've talked about in reference to knowing who to pray for and how to pray. We've talked about looking around within our, our, our worship service and specifically on a prayer meeting night. We look around and see who is not there, who has usually been there. By the way, if you haven't usually been there, I would encourage you to be a part of our, our Wednesday night prayer service at 6.30 p.m. And, and that is a... We, we've identified... We've called that the the engine room of our church as we go forward, as we meet to pray together. But as we look around and notice who is not there, perhaps on a more regular basis, who have been here and now for many weeks have not been, we can get discouraged. Perhaps we get discouraged by recognizing over the past four years since our pastor has come, uh, recently, since 2020, and we look around and see how many new people do we have in this church that we did not have four years ago. Well, I see a couple at least that I don't want to necessarily point out to you, but we get the sense of questioning and wondering, are we really growing as a church? What are we doing that perhaps gives us the sense that we are not growing. Why have we looked back on the last four years and we see so many one-time visitors that will come in and get a sense of what our church looks like and, and feels like and how it sounds as we sing and they don't come back again? What are we missing? What are we not doing to retain these? And we see discouragement setting in. And it's not just you. I have my own concerns that I am also discouraged over certain things. Even today, I have an individual who is thoroughly convinced that I've lied to him and he now considers me his enemy and won't talk to me. And I'm afraid that that conversation is not going to go any further. And that hurts. It's discouraging. And how many times have I wondered, you know, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting close to that magic age of 65. I know, I've still got four years, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm, not, 
I'm not getting that discouraged, right? But you know, this is this is what happens. And this is a natural thing for individuals, for the church, for your pastor. And so as I look at Ephesians chapter 3, I found within the middle of Ephesians chapter 3 a statement of encouragement that I want to share with you. And it begins with the very first verse. Chapter 3 begins, well, where chapter 2 left off. For this cause. And we look back at chapter 2 and we can see what we uh, had preached on last week. How in the beginning of chapter 2, verse 2, we recognize that we were dead, but God has quickened us. In verse 5, made us alive. We recognize that in verse 12, we were without hope before God in this world, but God made us nigh unto him. In verse 13. God has reconciled us by the cross through faith. If we are willing to acknowledge the repentance that goes along with the faith, we can be reconciled by the cross. We recognize in verse 19 where we were strangers, but now God has made us fellow citizens and built us together for God to dwell with us. And that is where the church comes in. That is the importance of the church. We work together. We fellowship together. We don't, we don't scrutinize over each other's pasts. We encourage each other to go forward. This is the value and the benefit of being associated with and being a member of a local, independent, fundamental Baptist church. For this cause, Paul is writing, for this cause, I, Paul, now, I'll stop right there, too, because I want to understand the grammatical structure of what we're reading. And you'll recognize in some of Paul's statements, he goes on and on and on, and he adds this, that, and the other thing to his statements before he finally gets to what he really wants. Well, maybe that's not the best way to put it, but he, he has some long sentences, and sometimes it's hard to understand them grammatically. He says, I, Paul... And then he starts to describe himself, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And he describes a few other things, uh, being the steward of the grace of God. So as he's about to say something, he says, I, Paul, as a steward of the grace of God, and in verses 3 through 6, he talks about how the, the mystery was revealed to him, the mystery of Gentiles being included in God's grace, and being combined together in one body, that being the church. And it's, and when we combine it with verse 9, we have I, Paul, declaring to the enemy in verse 10 God's purpose for the church. And I, Paul, given boldness in verse 12 and access with confidence by faith. And these are all the things that Paul has added to his description of what I, Paul, is referring to. So, for the cause of recognizing where we've been and what God has brought us to through our salvation, Paul is saying, I, Paul, being the steward of God's grace and of the mystery that is revealed, preaching to all men, declaring to the enemy God's purpose for the church and glory. Finally, we get to verse 13 where we get the next word of Paul's sentence. I, Paul, desire. Wherefore, because of all of these descriptions of Paul, because Paul is a steward of God's grace to the Gentiles and is uh, proclaiming even to the world around us the, the benefit of the church, I, Paul, being a steward of God's grace and for the cause of God, having brought us to him, desire this thing. What Paul is desiring here, what Paul is asking for the believers to do in the church that he was addressing, he says, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you. My tribulations for you is your glory. 
Don't be faint-hearted. Don't lose heart. Don't get discouraged because of my tribulations. Don't get down or discouraged because of the challenges that are coming against me, Paul, because it is my desire to share with you the grace of God in allowing us to work together as a church. I ask, verse 13, that ye faint not at my tribulations for you. Now, I have indicated that I also have discouragements, and I would ask that you not get faint-hearted, not lose heart over the fact that I sometimes face some discouragements. But you also are looking around and perhaps considering in your own heart and mind how that you are discouraged over certain things, and we are encouraged by Paul here to recognize that all of these things that we, by which we might become discouraged, we have a simple request, a simple asking of Paul, not even a begging or an, an encouragement and any more than simply asking, that we don't let ourselves get discouraged. Is not discouragement something that we choose? I might venture to suggest. There are people who face the same circumstances that we do and they don't always get, they don't get discouraged like we do. You can find some brave souls in the faith who have lived many, many years and have been through many, many well, they've lived through their own discouragements and they've come through those discouragements and realized that the grace of God is still working for God's glory in our lives. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Something tells me I'm missing a phrase in here somewhere, but you know the verse. God is working in our circumstances. We may not like it. We don't always care for what God is doing. We might rather choose something different. But in the process of all of our circumstances, and in face of that which could get us discouraged, we are to choose. That is simply Paul's desire. He asks that we do not lose heart. He asks that we do not become discouraged. And then he does something that we need to recognize and that we need to be doing for ourselves. He says, I, Paul, desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory, for this cause, the glory of the church, for this cause, Paul says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So for the cause of our salvation, Paul says, I, Paul, desire that ye be not discouraged, and he says that for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father. Paul is praying for the church that he was writing to in Ephesus and to the other churches to whom this letter was being passed. And as we look back at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul says, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now some have suggested that that at Ephesus might not necessarily be in some of the original Greek texts, but that doesn't hurt us a bit because we recognize that Paul's letters were intended to be distributed and read one to Ephesus, the letter from Ephesus to be read in other churches in other towns, other local churches. But it is to the faithful in Christ Jesus, to those churches and to our church as well, to all who are faithful in Christ Jesus, Paul is praying this prayer for us. Here is Paul's prayer for the church that will help us to overcome Satan's temptation that we be discouraged. You catch how I worded that? 
Paul is praying to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that, and this is the first of four that's that are going to build out of Paul's prayer. He prays, first of all, that God, our Heavenly Father, would grant to us, according to the riches of His glory, which He's already established, are limitless, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Now, here's a, a contrast to what we are asked to do. We are asked to choose to not lose heart. And we find that God will strengthen us with strength, with might, by His Spirit in the inner man. When we choose contrary to discouragement, we find that God's grace according to the riches of His glory, gives us strength by His Holy Spirit in our inner man. You see, with our salvation experience, we recognize that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. And as we choose to go forward, we find the strength of the Holy Spirit in our inner man. But that's for a purpose. In verse 17, we are strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that or so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. The strength that we get in our inner man is what gives us the strength to deal with the indwelling Holy Spirit, that Christ may dwell in our hearts. By faith, we believe and trust that Jesus Christ took all our sins upon himself so that not just so that he could leave us without a condemnation, but so that he might dwell within us as we have faith in him. We find that he gives us strength so that Christ may dwell within us. And that for the purpose, as we see the next word, that. So that being rooted and grounded in love, we may be able to comprehend with all saints the love of Christ. As I skip down to verse 19, Christ may dwell in our hearts, that we being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend that love. There is dimension to this love. This isn't just a heartfelt thing. There is length and breadth. There's depth and height. There is an understanding of some love, and as you start to understand the, the uh, dimensions of God's love, we, we find out that we can't possibly contain in our minds all of the understanding of God's love. So it is described as the love of Christ which passes knowledge. It exceeds what we are capable of imagining in the love of God. And, uh, and the comprehension, God wants us to comprehend His love. We can't know fully His love, we can't imagine the limits of His love, but He wants us to understand His love. And so he gives us strength in the inner man that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith so that we can understand his love for us for the purpose, and here's the fourth, that, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. That we might be filled unto all the fullness of God. Now, we can't possibly even consider all of what God is that we could contain within our minds. That's not what we're talking about. That would be impossible. If we could fully comprehend all there is to understand about God in our puny little mind, then what have we done? We have just reduced God to something that we can keep in our mind like the genie in the bottle in Aladdin's lamp. <clears throat> we cannot contain God in our minds. 
But we can be filled up to all the fullness of God that God will allow us to have within our minds, within our bodies, within our circumstances. All of what God wants us to have and to en encourage us to enjoy. God wants to fill us with all fullness, with all that we could possibly contain of the fullness of God. So now we can take this prayer as Paul's encouragement to us and we can put the final two verses of the chapter together with it where Paul is taking all of this climax as the fullness of God and taking it one step further as our prayer that now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly even above and beyond what we've already talked about according to the power that works in us what is God's power that works in us is that not the same power that raised up Christ from the dead and has raised us up also past tense has also seated us together with Christ in heavenly places. It's a done deal. If we've received Christ as our Savior and we have trusted in Him, God has established this for us. Unto Him be glory in the church. We as a church should be coming together and glorifying God for all that he has done. And we have a specific focus on the Wednesday evening prayer service to do that. And there are many other opportunities perhaps that we might also take advantage of. God's power working in us, the church. And we will continue to glorify Christ. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. And that without end. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for the encouragement that we find in your word. We recognize, God, that you are sharing this with us through your word because you know our circumstances sometimes will get us discouraged. And we thank you, God, for the encouragement of Paul through his circumstances writing to the church in Ephesus as well as the other churches that would read his letter regarding our salvation through Jesus Christ, being reminded of the stewardship of your grace we are asked to encourage our hearts. And we thank you, God, for strengthening us in our inner man as we choose to follow you and to follow the way of glorifying you. Lord, when we get discouraged, help us to instead glorify you, to thank you for being in control of our lives even when we don't understand why things are happening the way they are. Give us, O oh God, that strength in the inner being that Christ may dwell in our hearts because of our faith. So that as we are rooted and grounded in love, we may comprehend the fullness of your love for us. Work in us, O oh God. Help us to always give you glory as we work together as a church and that Satan and his forces in this world will, will be ridiculed as your church demonstrates the grace of God in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. In closing, I'd like to take us to hymn number 576. And we'll sing together number 576, A Glorious Church. And that's what we are supposed to be. Number 576, let's stand together as we sing our final hymn. i
life gets better up on Thank you.